uh, and good up and good afternoon to you all and welcome to this uh, debate that we have this afternoon within chess on artificial intelligence and in healthcare which we've organized together with the all policies for a healthy europe initiative my name is, as you can see, Hans Martens, and I'm the chair of CHESS, the Coalition for Health, Ethics and Society, the health program of the European Policy Center, which is kindly supported by a educational grant from Johnson & Johnson. Now, on uh, artificial intelligence, I think it sets out a lot of hope uh, for solving problems within healthcare, but it also raises fears about a number of issues, about trust in how it works, uh, will it take over uh, from the human control at some point. What about the use of data? What about the safety and security of data issues uh, has come up in the discussion. I've personally worked quite a lot on how we can improve prevention and uh, make more precise, precise diagnosis and thereby with the help of data and artificial intelligence set out the most efficient and least invasive uh, patient pathways. So I'm convinced that uh, artificial intelligence AI can help us improve healthcare and create a lot of value, not only for patients, but also for the health systems that are under pressure and for our societies that are under pressure for paying for it as well. But the question is how to manage the use of artificial intelligence. The European Commission has earlier this year set out a proposal for regulation of a European approach for AI. So we can, under a European set of rules and guidelines, foster development and uptake of AI in accordance with the values that we have in Europe and the legislation, of course, that we also have. I think we'll hear a lot more about that in, uh, in uh, this afternoon's di discussion. Um, but I believe that I can already conclude that it would be extremely important uh, to succeed in a fast development of a common set of rules in the EU to avoid fragmentation, which has already probably started, but also to give incentives for the cooperation across the borders and avoid um, 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 unnecessary duplication, which often happens when we when we don't have a set of, of European rules. So uh, I'm hopeful that we can uh, give it a push this afternoon and that uh, we can have this framework as soon as possible. We'll come back to that. But uh, I just want again to welcome you back to the discussion. But first, we will hear a message from the member of European Parliament via Petra Kumpala Natri, followed by an intervention from Professor Milan Petkovic, who is head of research on artificial intelligence and data science, representing the, our partners in, in this program this afternoon, the All Policy for Healthy Europe Alliance, uh, where he puts in a lot of energy besides his normal uh, workday at uh, Philips in Netherlands. So uh, after that, we will have intervention from a panel with not least, less than five excellent panelists. And um, I hope we also then will have time for a good discussion with those of you who wants uh, to raise points. And you will be able to do that when we finish with the, uh, uh, with the introduction from the, from the panelists. But in any case, we have a lot of speakers, so I don't think I should take more time now. So I quickly give the floor to uh, our um, guest from the European Parliament today, Mia Pietra Kumpula Natri. So over to you. Dear participants, I'm very happy to greet you on this very important, interesting and topical issue about the health and artificial intelligence. First, I will tell you some of my ideas about the AI itself. Second, I will talk about the data and uh, underlying driver for the A all AI applications. I have the honor to serve as the first vice president for the special committee in the European Parliament called ADA, Artificial Intelligence in the Digital Age. In our committee, we have just now started work on the final report uh, on the Parliament's view for the future of AI. We embrace the benefits and possibilities with the AI with open arms. AI has potential to speed up the development on, of new drugs, treatments and vaccines with a lower cost, improve diagnosis and detection of diseases, and enable doctors and nurses to save time that can be used to take closer care of the patients. This point uh, to need to think uh, how we want to use AI intelligence in the healthcare. This is important that we don't aim to replace 
but empower human caretakers, doctors and nurses. After all, human health is extremely complex thing and we should not take it by the hype. As one example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, I read that there was a huge push to use AI to diagnose with the virus, as I uh, saw the number that they were studied, uh, the 2,232 uh, prediction models that were used to diagnose COVID-19. The others concluded that one uh, alone, none of them were fit to clinical use. I think this is a good reminder of uh, us to need to keep on the loop the human. AI is a tool for specialists, doctors and science. So human smartness and the raw capabilities AI are together the winning team in the European century uh, of human-centric AI. Uh, next, I would like to say a few words about the AI Act proposed by the Commission in last March and now uh, worked in the European Parliament as well as the Member States. In my opinion, the Commission uh, proposal is a good uh, to have a path with their risk-based approach. It is important to notice that we are not banning AI. We are just calling for the human-centric and responsible uh, approach the systems that govern our lives. If there is a high risk, there must be responsibility. This is nothing new. Think about how we test medicines and vaccines before they enter to the markets. Why wouldn't we audit algorithms with high risk use cases before they are on the markets? So now let me uh, talk about the data, because I think we should remember that we cannot speak about AI without speaking about the data. If algorithms are the, the engine, then data is the fuel. Even the finest engine is useless without fuel to power it. This is why it is so important to understand and make sure that we can use the, take best use of the European data to benefit us all. At the moment, we are finalizing the negotiations of the Data Governance Act. The key guiding objective of this legislation is to make non-personal data to flow freely in Europe, in common European data spaces. Uh, we have a figure that 80% uh, of the data existing already is not used uh, at this maximum. The Data Act, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the Data Governance Act opens the door on the idea of donating data to the causes that serve public interest also. But one of the biggest areas where sharing the data can help us most is very personal health. Sharing genomic data, patient records or other types of the data can improve delivery of care as well as benefit medical research. This means faster recovery, more precise medicine and bluntly healthier and happier Europe. In this respect, I'm er uh, eagerly waiting Commission proposal on European health data spaces, which we are still waiting to get by the end of the year. However, there are very important considerations to balance here. Europe has been the path breaker in creating rights in the data economy, GDPR being the prime example to protect our privacy. And that way we do not want to compromise. But creating good circumstances, it's not a hinder, it makes still uh, ecosystems possible. When we share data of our bodies or our health or our vulnerabilities, it is extremely important that we stay in the control of the use of the data. Here I would like to take a moment to express my pride of the country I know best, Finland. Finland has been very active in developing the best practices on how to use the health data in a responsible and human-centric way. Finland has already established a social and health data permit authority, Findata, that promotes secondary use of the Finnish social and healthcare data for research. At the moment, the Finnish innovation fund Citra is coordinating the EU's joint action towards the European health data space TEHDAS, uh, which aims to create common rules for the secondary use of the health data in the European level. Dear audience, I wish we all have the same target, 
make Europe healthier and use AI as a tool. But do not forget our values where we want to see future Europe healthier, but also taking care of our human-centric way about the privacy and our uh, us being the master and then the technology being then helping us. Thank you very much to uh, our guest from the European Parliament. It seems there's a lot of support also for rapid solutions here uh, and clearly an indication of AI as being one of the instruments that we can use to ease the pressure that everybody's seeing on the, uh, on the health systems uh, these days. I just saw the recent um, world edition of Health at a Glance from the OECD and have noticed how how much the uh, the pressure has been increasing uh, due to the pandemic and, and due to all the uh, the delayed treatments and so on and so forth. So so uh, clearly an indication of a way to ease it. And also I noticed the uh, the issue about donating data because there's a lot of fear in giving away your health data. But in a way. Uh, you could look at it as, as as donating as well as you can donate an organ, you know, for transplantation and so on, uh, because it is really a way to help other people uh, in order to get better to better treatments. So uh, good to hear that, but also the warnings, of course, that we I already mentioned in the introduction about uh, the ethics issues here and the data safety and security issues. So it is uh, thanks to the. Uh, to our guest from the European Parliament, I'd like to turn to uh, Professor Dr. Milan Petkovic uh, from sitting in the Netherlands here today, uh, but being here as a as our guest from our uh, alliance partner, uh, Healthy Europe. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much um, um, for inviting me to this uh, event. I'm uh, very happy I can share uh, industrial perspective on the role of uh, data and AI in the transformation of uh, healthcare. Um, I'll, uh, I'll talk about uh, opportunities, how to improve healthcare by applying AI uh, in actually very much in line with uh, what you just heard about uh, human perspective of it and uh, the uh, sort of human experience um, view. Uh, but I will also talk about challenges to deliver on uh, on these opportunities uh, and then deliver at scale to transform actually the healthcare sector. So let me start with the, with opportunities. Uh, I think uh, AI has a great potential to improve uh, people's life. Uh, uh, and in Philips, we say from prevention through diagnosis and treatment to home care. So basically addressing the whole healthcare continuum. There are three ways uh, in which AI can actually improve healthcare. First of all, uh, you know, I think it's very, very clear to everyone that AI can augment the expertise of healthcare providers, support their decision making by extracting important insights from from uh, bigger, increasingly bigger amounts of data that uh, that they need to manage. Uh, secondly. Uh, as, as already mentioned, uh, healthcare systems are nowadays overstretched. There is not enough stuff. Uh, there are increased costs. So there, there are really, really uh, very, very critical challenges that uh, healthcare is facing. AI can address these challenges and improve operational efficiency to help actually healthcare providers to focus on patient care. And next to that, AI can improve the management of uh, health crises or, or pandemics through effective analysis of health risks. Finally, the third uh, point is that with AI, we can help actually people to take better care of their health and well-being. For example, offering personalized uh, and actionable insights that, uh, that help them actually to maintain their healthy habits and move from, from reactive to proactive uh, healthcare. There are a number of examples uh, of, uh, of uh, AI-enabled solutions that uh, Philips already put on the market in clinical use, but let me briefly just give you one, one example to picture these benefits. And uh, I selected an example about detecting early signs of uh, patient uh, deterioration in general care settings. So at Philips, we developed uh, an early warning uh, scoring system, which automatically takes patient uh, vital signs like, like uh, heart rate, uh, uh, blood pressure, etc., calculates an early warning score, which is customized to an individual patient's uh, and, and needs of, of a particular hospital and displays that, that, that score at the point of care. So that notifies responsible caregivers in advance 
that a patient will develop a critical condition and give them time to react to prevent that. And, and, and as said uh, by previous speaker, we would like uh, these AI algorithms to check. And, and, and for example, this algorithm was validated in hospitals and showed 20% decrease of hospital uh, uh, mortality, 24 decrease of uh, EICU readmission. So these patients were uh, uh, with 25% uh, less moved to EICU. 35% uh, uh, decrease of severe uh, adverse events, and then 86% uh, decrease of uh, cardiopulmonary arrests. So uh, uh, these are the, the, you know, these validated numbers that you want to see and, uh, and then scale up uh, in, in Europe. Um, yeah, so there is a, the, there is a big potential, uh, potential benefits of AI in healthcare and they're increasingly clear to everyone, but then the deployment of uh, AI technologies faces many challenges, which we need to address so that we can actually deploy them at scale. Uh, firstly is trust. And that's a paramount of promoting wider adoption of, uh, of AI. That calls for methods to prevent bias, to prevent privacy issues or, or ethical issues. Uh, at Philips, we, we are basically committed to do uh, safe and responsible use of data and AI in particular, and we put forward our, our uh, data and AI principles. Also, the coalition uh, stressed in the, in, the, in the last year policy paper on uh, digital transformation that uh, a multi-stakeholder approach is key here, because only by engaging citizens, patients, healthcare providers, healthcare professionals, uh, the private sector, we can get to a sustainable, uh, dynamic, and, and flexible AI deployment. Uh, secondly, for, for, for the wider uh, uh, deployment of AI, we, uh, we have to ensure that these AI-enabled solutions are seamlessly integrated in the workflows of, uh, of uh, healthcare providers, and, and they, they actually uh, are easily uh, accessible through their uh, through uh, daily uh, routines that they, they have. Um, thirdly, uh, the successful digital health and transformation requires actually also to empower citizens uh, to help them understand actually the benefits that that this technology can bring, and then and then. Uh, uh, we need to ensure also that basically the data access is there so that, that we have a sort of like uh, arranged data sharing interoperability and ecosystem partnerships. Uh, and, and then obviously, finally, it's about data and technology too. So it's, uh, uh, we, we have to ensure, as I mentioned, data access. We need to ensure that we uh, sufficiently invest in creation of, of data sets, but also research to develop uh, these important uh, 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 elements of technology that would enable trust, like explainability of AI. Uh, and we need to ensure that, that uh, uh, patients, but also healthcare professionals, sufficiently understand these technologies so that they can actually trust. Let me finish by uh, briefly addressing the proposal for AI Act. Um, so as, as mentioned, uh, this year, European Commission publishes proposal uh, to promote the use of AI and address uh, the risk uh, associated with its use. Uh, and uh, obviously, while a robust regulatory framework is uh, crucial, I think it's also important to understand that healthcare sector and medical devices uh, specifically have been regulated for a long time. And uh, in that respect, we had the medical device regulation uh, and that already offers detailed and extensive requirements, mm. uh, which are covering various aspects of the proposed AI Act. Uh, um, consequently, AI-based medical devices should be regulated by, the, uh, by that sectorial legislation, and, uh, and that will also ensure that, that, uh, that we can support new requirements uh, and address any remaining gaps uh, for, for these requirements through, through these regulations. Uh, and, and, and we need to avoid to create uh, new barriers for, for the deployment, why the deployment of this technology uh, and, uh, and actually uh, benefits that uh, it can bring. So with this, I would like to finish and wish you a very fruitful, uh, fruitful discussion. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for being with us. And thank you very much for uh, addressing this on behalf of our partner in the event here today. Uh, the point you, a lot of points you mentioned are, are reinforcing the, the issues that we have been discussing already. But you also mentioned the, the question about investments and how we can stimulate investments. And I'm pretty certain uh, we can come back to that because uh, the 
the, the, the rapid rollout of a European framework for doing this is probably something that would stimulate and give bigger markets, you know, and stimulate the inno innovation and the uptake as well. So thank you very much for being here. And with those uh, words, I would now turn to our panel. And, and um, I would like uh, to start with uh, Rachel. Dunskamp, I hope I pronounce it reasonably well. I haven't uh, no, don't know the name so well, but you are a visiting professor at Imperial College in London and director of the Digital Health Leadership Program. So very well suited, I think, to talk about the issue here from, let's say, the academic perspective. So over to you, Rachel. Thank you. I, I'm, I also have a role. I sit on the AI Council for the UK government and I hold the pen for healthcare. Uh, so previously I've been a an operational CIO, the most digitally mature organization in the NHS. So I come from both a practitioner and a policy perspective, as well as an academic perspective. And the one thing that I've become incredibly interested in is how we do things safely at scale and at pace. Um, that has been my interest both operationally and, and in policy perspectives. Now, the good news from my AI sort of role is that everyone on the AI Council, which is multi-sectorial, it's not just healthcare and life sciences, is very pro remaining in Europe um, in terms of our alignment with policy, our, our work together and our support. And I do apologize, I've been joined by a, a digital health cat here. Um, so my, my perspective very much is that we need to um, continue to work in parallel. I was recently at a session um, on GDPR um, and what comes after GDPR within the UK. Um, and we really do want to remain in line with Europe. Um, I think many of the, the use cases and cases in points were around the use of intelligence uh, in cancers, intelligence in um, rare diseases and sat next to me was uh, the, the, um, the, the lead from Genomics England, sat across the table was the data lead for the NHS. The point being we have to stay in lockstep because unless we do, we will not be saving lives and improving lives. And, and just as data saves lives has moved to Europe from, from the work we did in the UK, we, we absolutely must remain for um, you know, our citizens sake working together. So that that's very much the good news from me from 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 my side because my, my fear was with Brexit that we would uh, not be um, we would not be treading such a common path. Um, from the 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 sort of um, operational side, the very interesting piece that 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 I've I've been working on is the life cycle management of algorithms, the safety systems and how you uh, automate the, the oversight of algorithms and intelligence and AI so that our doctors and nurses can supervise it. And then training our doctors and nurses from my academy role so that they can be masters of owning these algorithms um, and owning this intelligence. And that is something that I think that we need to take our time over. If we do that too fast, we will not get it right. We need to take that journey together. I've taken inspiration personally from the nuclear industry and the aviation industry who I've been working with multi-sectorially on the AI Council. And actually we do have commonalities with other industries where uh, there are high risks or, or, or life is dependent on those industries. And so um, for me, uh, those sorts of pieces that allow us to put um, safe supervision around these, uh, you know, these pieces of intelligence or AI. Um, I very much talk about some of the AI being quite like a junior doctor or nurse. They, they need supervision, training, maintaining, they need to, you know, be appraised. Um, and so creating the, the equivalent of the systems we have around human performance is the metaphor I very often uh, use when I'm working with boards. But very interesting period uh, and very delighted to be part of the work that is happening in Europe. And I hope we can continue the, the journey together. I hope so too. And thank you very much, Rachel. So uh, Brexit is one thing, but we need uh, in many ways to try to keep the, the work together because we, we can't do it without you in these areas. But uh, I know there are some hard discussions going on right at the moment. So let's hope we'll not get into another hard Brexit and so on. So we can continue co uh, cooperation. And thank you also for 
for sharing your intelligence and thank you for bringing back the cat. I think it's quite nice and I'm actually quite happy that I didn't bring in my dog here because there might have been some uh, uh, barking and meowing. So, uh, but uh, it's a nice cat. So, uh, it's a Norwegian uh, forest cat. So, it's oh, definitely yeah, an international. That might be. Well, okay, that's fine. I, I saw that immediately, of course. Now, uh, a lot of talk has been uh, about the practitioners using this and the healthcare professionals. Sarah Roda, you are senior advisor with the, uh, the standing committee of the European doctors. Uh, you're sitting at the moment, so not standing doctor. But anyway, uh, what about you? Because uh, are the doctors a bit afraid that uh, the artificial intelligence should be too clever for them or take over? Over to uh, you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you also for the invitation. We are very happy to be here and to be able to express our point of view. Um, and indeed, we hope that AI uh, stays positive. Uh, and we think that uh, much will depend on how the AI Act uh, will be in the end and the civil liability uh, regime that will be put in place. Uh, there is a real shift happening uh, uh, with the digitalization of healthcare. Uh, we have um, the healthcare delivery with telemedicine, uh, medical practices being reshaped with the new digital competences that are required, the patient-doctor relationship in this virtual environment where the electronic device assumes an important role not only to retrieve data from patients to store, so the communication uh, is changing, and, but as we heard previously before, we cannot lose sight of the humanity that characterizes the, the the medical profession. Uh, we also heard about uh, the capabilities of uh, AI in increasing uh, um, the accuracy of diagnosis, the efficiency of treatments in medicine development, um, and also in the management of workflow. But as we also heard, for, and for CPME, AI should have this assistive role. This is why I normally like to call it, uh, uh, the, use the term augmented intelligence um, and not artificial intelligence, because it is indeed to, to try to enhance efficiency and expertise in this area. And so we need to keep and maintain the professional oversight over the AI clinical validation. Uh, we see also many challenges ahead, and I will just point to three. One is indeed that AI requires plenty of data, and uh, we have to make sure that when we use uh, uh, health data for research purposes or policy making, we have patient's consent. And if this is not possible, then we need to involve uh, ethics committees. Uh, the other point is uh, data should be on good quality. We have as, uh, heard this already. The, the way data is coded varies. Uh, currently now, um, amounts of data are being produced by doctors and everything is coded differently. The semantics uh, uh, too and also the format. So for CPME, we would support the directive uh, with minimum requirements on interoperability uh, uh, to, and this also for seeing uh, specific financial funding uh, in this regard. And um, as a third challenging, uh, and we also heard about educating current and future uh, doctors on AI, not only uh, medical education, but CPD uh, to train them in different areas. And we have published a paper on this uh, uh, which uh, we can refer it back. Um, as concerns also addressed, uh, health data sharing, we need to maintain a high level of data uh, protection, patients' privacy, medical confidentiality. These uh, can all be at risk with the new digital technologies. Um, also when developing AI uh, products and services, take into account patients' and physicians' perspective, because we can indeed give advice on the amount of data that is required on minimum outputs uh, expected. And a third point would be because, and we see that the, uh, there is a, a need with the commun commission communication on this path to digital decades to have more than 20 million uh, ICT professionals. So this is a new uh, profession, a new generation. And so we think they need to meet high ethical standards if they are going to manage uh, health data, be subject to professional obligations or disciplinary sanctions. And I think this uh, would be a key requirement to trust ICT professionals. Um, we also think that the AI could have a very important role. We supported the uh, AI Act um, and also issue a paper on this. And perhaps I would just highlight also uh, three points in this area. 
medical obligations, in our view, uh, resulting from the use of AI in healthcare should be supervised by medical regulators, this to guarantee the quality of uh, healthcare. Um, there is still some unclarity on what will be the, the competent authorities in this regard, so we think that agreements and collaborations will be required to determine the roles and responsibilities, uh, because AI involves also uh, the protection of personal data. And so we, we will have different entities under the AI regulation, the data protection and the medical devices regulation. So this, we need some coordination. But we also think that AI systems need uh, to comply with data protection law. And so we think the, the legislation should have more uh, requirements, clear requirements in this. And for CPME, in our view, the CE marking should only be given to those um, systems that comply with data protection, a minimum. So for example, and not to be too wide, to have a data protection impact assessment and have specific considerations for self-learning AI that they are using data protection. Um, and also, and finally, a system of redress uh, should be developed for the AI user. So for example, if a doctor uses the AI according to the training that is provided with the, in adherence with the instructions, and if something goes wrong, he should be fully indemnified in this. Um, well, I can also reserve uh, later if there are uh, questions uh, arise. Thank you. I'm sure there will be, and thank you very much, Sarah. But uh, just one here now, just before we go on very briefly, uh, you said you had uh, published a paper on uh, on the readiness, if I could put it that way, of the medical profession or of the doctors. Are they ready now? I mean, could that be a barrier for introducing the whole thing, is in your opinion? Indeed. So doctors are not quite uh, ready yet. Uh, something that we are also calling is to have and identify digital leaders, which is something that we see as needed, uh, because with these there can be, with their example, others uh, may follow. And uh, in terms of digital competences, uh, uh, doctors are not fully prepared uh, uh, on this regard. So uh, in, uh, on this point, uh, governments uh, should indeed invest in programs that enhance uh, digital health literacy uh, and skills um, to support these digital leaders. Uh, and. And also, uh, well, they should only, in our view, invest in, in digital technologies that uh, prove to be efficient um, for the quality of care, patient safety, and the patient-doctor relationship. Because we think not all AI that is out there is of good quality. So we have to make sure that uh, the systems choose wisely. Yeah, thank you very much. I asked uh, the question because I think it's important to face the the barriers that might be, you know, for the quick uh, rollout and, of course, the safe rollout as well. Uh, so this could be one of them. And one thing is, of course, the, the literacy needed, but the other thing is also to be able to see the perspectives of, of using the AI uh, for the benefit of the patients and uh, the rest of society. So, uh, but then I could ask Michel Calabro, who is uh, coming from the, the European uh, Patient Forum, um, are the patients ready then and uh, are they or are we going to create barriers here because of some resistance because of lack of discussion and secondly are we going to create some inequalities perhaps because some are more ready than others over to you Michel. thanks thanks a lot hans and actually it's it's uh, it's perfect to to come after saya because indeed uh, the, the the closing uh, bit of of her introduction about how important it is to to bring you know professionals and patients together it's actually something that we see as as of crucial importance ourselves in working on on artificial intelligence so that's indeed uh, an important starting point i mean um First of all, not without repeating uh, what was already said, also uh, from the patient point of view, there's there's a clear understanding of the potential that artificial intelligence has to transform healthcare. And we discussed already about uh, all the different potential uh, applications from you know population health, uh, healthcare operation, healthcare related innovation. So I think it's first of all clear that artificial intelligence has quite some uh, uh, some potential impact and more specifically in patients it can indeed as was mentioned touch on self-care prevention uh, uh, improve wellness in general diagnosis uh, um, clinical decision support and care delivery ultimately without forgetting of course um, how we can help you know also making better policy uh, decisions so 
uh, starting starting from from this point of view, I think uh, um, in terms of how ready we are, uh, probably there is a, there is a little bit of uh, uh, of fraud to to still to still do uh, because we get to 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 a readiness uh, that is enough to you know engage with artificial intelligence. Um, we actually had, of course, uh, engage uh, from the uh, from the beginning when the white paper on artificial intelligence uh, was published uh, uh, by the European Commission, and we had we had like several discussion internally with our membership to really try to understand what are the key expectations and what are the key challenges uh, from from the patient community in in a way to make sure that we engage in the right way in a discussion. And I just want to point out to a couple of uh, uh, the, the most, let's say, expected impact in terms of artificial intelligence. The first, of, the first of them I actually mentioned already. It's really to have a better, uh, uh, better relation with healthcare professional. That's that's very very important indeed. Of course, uh, we do not want the healthcare professional to be replaced by artificial intelligence, but we want healthcare professional to be supported by artificial intelligence. And in doing so, of course, as as I mentioned already, uh, skills. And at the right pace, as also Rachel uh, mentioned, it's absolutely fundamental because uh, there is an important uh, triangle of trust, let's say, between innovation professionals and patients. And this needs to be fueled with the right literacy from all the levels, basically, and from all the uh, from all the three of these key actors. Uh, another key element that uh, uh, the patient community is really looking forward to explore more about AI is, of course, how you can facilitate self-care and provide more information to how you treat uh, your own disease, both for you as a patient and also the carers. Uh, it's of course clear that it can help to improve the quality and efficiency of diagnosis and research and innovation, and ultimately improve how health systems are ready to provide better care uh, to, to patients. So in a way, these are the key things that uh, as the patient community we're looking at. Uh, but of course, we do realize that there is a little bit of gap in terms of uh, uh, what are the expectations, what is happening, and also the challenges that were in a way already mentioned. And in terms of challenging, uh, I think what we see as patient community is first of all, the potential lack of involvement if the co-design of artificial intelligence solution, which is linked to one of the key words that I think we're going to uh, discuss a lot today, which is trust in a way. The more you are involved, uh, the more you can understand both from the regulatory point of view to the actual use and uh, application of AI, the more you will be able to trust and engage with it. It applies to everything about digital health, actually, data and AI in particular. Therefore, this is linked to transparency on our artificial intelligence work. Of course, not all patients uh, will be able to engage in the same way, but there has to be a minimal level of transparency. This is enough to give patients, you know, the insurance and the guarantee that even if they do not have if they're not the most digital health literate patient, you do not create that inequality gap in understanding and engaging and making the most of of, uh, of digital technology. Then, I mean, uh, other things that we are looking at, uh, we already mentioned the importance of data. It's absolutely crucial. Without good data, AI cannot provide uh, the, the, let's say, everything that we expect from it. Um, and of course, there has been a particular attention in terms uh, uh, of uh, risks, uh, um, what could be in terms of an incorrect diagnosis uh, uh, and how to act uh, if this if this happened, of course. Uh, liability redress are a key words that were already mentioned and definitely we are on board on that. And ultimately, the patient community really want to have this tool as a support to healthcare professionals. So, it has to remain a human interaction uh, uh, with professionals supported as much as possible uh, by, by artificial intelligence. So I think, you know, these are the key elements of where we stand now in terms of how close we are to, to having like a sort of friendly relationship with, uh, uh, with AI, it, it, it depends a lot. In general terms, uh, even from us at EPF, it's, it's, it's a, it's a fairly new uh, topic and it's a new topic for all patient organization, which creates indeed 
um, in a way a challenge when it comes to provide our views uh, uh, to, to, to the current regulation and everything. So I think uh, actually a, a role that EPF is trying to take is to create this capacity for patient and patient organization to feel more empowered and better engage in uh, uh, in the AI discussion, and that's actually something that we hope to see a lot as an opportunity within the different programs that the European Commission uh, is going to bring forward in the AI Act, but also in the European Health Data Space, which is going to be extremely interconnected uh, to, to artificial intelligence. Um, so I think this is, in in a way, the the, the not in a nutshell what uh, uh, what CPF or patient community view uh, on it. Uh, we are indeed engaging more and more on creating this uh, uh, distrust or self this understanding and capacity to interact uh, both at policy and clinical level uh, with AI. But of course, there are a number of steps that still needs to be uh, to be taken into into account, starting from. I would say in three words, trust, uh, transparency, um, and literacy. I think this is uh, in a way our our starting point. And of course, happy to continue the discussion with the, with the rest of the panel. Glad to hear that and also maybe from the audience. So trust, trust, trust seems to be the word that we, uh, uh, to okay, the major barrier, actually, the issue that we really need to to discuss. But as you were mentioning, also the question is, you know, patient empowerment. Who can be empowered? Is this for all, or is it for some? But uh, probably something we can pick up and discuss along the way. We turn once again to to industry. Uh, Claudia Herben, uh, you are. Uh, Vice President for Strategic Solutions in the Medical Devices uh, Department of Johnson & Johnson. Um, what is your take on this? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think a lot has been said already uh, from an industry perspective and just to uh, maybe uh, clarify my position. So uh, in my group, we're really looking into the digital transformation and the digital innovation of healthcare and how digital solutions uh, can really contribute to a better patient uh, outcome. And not just by us uh, as industry um, defining that, but really to go into the interactions with the patient, with the physician, with the hospital. And it's, that's good uh, that, I, I, uh, that we just got a testimony it's also from uh, the groups uh, representing all of these uh, stakeholders. And uh, also, of course, uh, because all uh, is linked to data, how artificial intelligence can um, really help us in that. And I'm not just here to represent uh, the view of the industry, uh, Johnson & Johnson, but also we are a proud member of the All Policies for a Healthy Europe. So it's really good to um, be the next one after Michelle to present. Now, what I want to share with maybe as a starting point is that um, I had a conversation with a lead physician in Italy a few uh, months ago. And when we were talking about digital transformation and uh, you know, what it could mean for healthcare, he really used the word that really resonated. And he said, you know, Claudia, um, you should compare, really, if you talk about digital solutions and the power of the data, compare it with a, like a medical Alexa that would assist all healthcare professionals in their practice with best possible insights for each patient and deliver best possible knowledge and technology tailored to the personal conditions. And it, the word came up a few times uh, and in the center of this, this is really about building uh, with care and trust, because without that, we can have the greatest solutions and the greatest data, but it will just not work. And so if I think of that term, it really resonated with me, and it also shows really the potential and the power of data. Now, uh, what we also have seen as an industry is COVID and how COVID has really impacted existing challenges, but accelerated even more the challenges um, like, uh, you know, the backlog uh, that uh, hospitals are facing, um, the capacity where they're looking for solutions and how to increase uh, re reducing the length of stay, all in mind with treating more patients and really removing that backlog. Uh, what we also saw is that patients not able to get to hospitals were really in a need for being informed, staying connected, uh, making sure that they understood like, what can be done and what needs to be done without them going into the hospitals. And what we learned is that where COVID of course is a, is a negative, it really created a lot of opportunity and potential of what is possible moving forward where you empower a patient 
and where you really help the surgeon through digitalization and how to increase that capacity and reduce the length of stay, but also on the hospital side, how to become more efficient uh, with, again, uh, minds of, uh, you know, treating more patients and get to better outcome. Now, of course, on the digital solutions, the key word also is of, next to the patient is the data. Health data is essential to advance uh, innovation and help patients because data is the element which connects um, and makes holistic, insightful, and personalized uh, care possible. So a win-win approach is vital to collect, analyze, and share health data to better understand diseases and treat them as part of a system delivering informed decisions, and finally, a personalized healthcare. So that data strategy is really about data and insights to ensure patient outcomes can be measured, but also about the trust to be built with the hospital to allow sharing of data. Healthcare data is one of the most sensitive and needs adequate protection. I think it was brought up a few times. So privacy, data protection are critical to build trust in, but also the embracement of new technologies. It is of high significance that what we do as an industry, as a healthcare industry, that we do that in a fully compliant way, given we are talking about patient data. And in case of failure, trust is at high risk, but not just trust. Think of the legal implications, the reputational implications. There is a lot that is um, at stake there. So for myself and talking to patients, physicians and hospitals in my, my function, they're all looking for solutions to help them in decision-making, pre-admission, inpatient, post-op, and support. And artificial intelligence has the potential to provide new dimensions across the continuum of care. And this is also the reason why we need to think of a connected ecosystem in order to do more informed um, uh, decisions so that the surgeon feels much more uh, informed and, and taking decisions that get a better outcome, having all information in one place and allowing them to also create a personalized treatment uh, for the patient. And so uh, the patient at the other hand also wants to be very well prepared, uh, empowered uh, in the driving seat of their pathway. And so if you really think of that, uh, it links back to my, um, my starting comments on medical Alexa. Now, building that ecosystem to deliver that seamless experience with the use of artificial intelligence, well, data is needed to drive stronger insights, help improve outcomes, and support evidence generation. Uh, and I think evidence generation came up earlier as well. So connected data and augmented analytics will increase learning, improve precision, consistency, and build a better personalized experience uh, for surgeons, but also for the patients. And um, that connectivity is connectivity, not just on the technology side at the digital solutions and the data, but also that collaboration and very strong connection that it has to be like with all these stakeholders, the patient, the surgeon, the hospital, the policymakers, the caregivers, all of them as a community needs to be connected as well. And um, a last um, area that I want to highlight for artificial intelligence is also the link um, and that artificial intelligence is providing a new dimension to robotics. And so with new applications and features, healthcare robotics um, are expected to increase the quality, the operational efficiency, accuracy, and safety in healthcare service delivery. And as expected, the combination of artificial intelligence and robotics will make the surgery go faster and much safer, which is again linked to the challenges that we see today. Now, data analytics improvement in hardware and software system will diversify robots uh, scope uh, in other healthcare fields. Because very often when we think of a robot, we link it immediately to the operation, the surgery side. But think of uh, the potential that you can achieve with uh, the robots more in the administrative side. And then I'm really thinking of the hospital, how they can drive efficiency, but also like uh, the infection rates and all of the potential that you can get out of uh, that. Um, the one thing where we probably will have to look into as a community is, of course, uh, robots are very expensive. And so, you know, the question of uh, who can really afford having the robot and uh, the access to that uh, specialized care of, of the patient. Yeah. Now, just a last comment beyond that robot, uh, the robotics, um, artificial intelligence tools have really shown promise in predicting patients' health journey. And so recommending treatments, guiding surgical care, monitoring patients, and supporting efforts to improve the health of a community. 
And so, for example, artificial intelligence can reduce clinicians' workloads, increase efficiency of administrative tasks, and even could support remote areas that don't have easy access today. So it really makes sure it's not just more affordable, but you also have more patients that get access to care. And so think more in terms of like telemedicine. So the world of digitized healthcare is within reach. It's here today. It's very exciting. And for me, uh, you know, I always, when I talk to, to my stakeholders, I, I always um, end with saying, imagine a world where hospitals run more efficiently, where people have access to quality care, patients, regardless of where they live, uh, remote, uh, there is uh, through the digital connection, they, they have the care they're looking for. And a world where surgical performance is constantly tracked and clinical improvements can be accelerated. And that for me is really the future of healthcare and the digitalization of healthcare and the key uh, role that artificial intelligence plays in it. Thank you very much, Claudia. That sounds uh, great, but it also means that we all need to have a very solid and good uh, digital infrastructure, uh, as it seems we all have here yes. today, but uh, also in the remote areas, if they can really work. The thing is also about creating trust, and uh, the question maybe we can discuss later today is who's going to create that trust, um, if, because it's trust for health professionals, it's trust for patients, it's trust for politicians, decision makers, payers, and so on and so forth. But I think the essential argument, as you were also mentioning, is that we shouldn't just talk about AI as AI, but also for the advantages that it gives uh, for everybody, for the patients and uh, for the health systems and for the resilience of the health systems, actually, which is the, the word everybody is using at, uh, at this point in time. And it all comes down to Salia Rina, who is uh, the... Uh, uh, head of sector for e-health and aging policy in DD Connect in the European Commission. I suppose you're sitting with the dossier. So can we expect it all in place before the end of the year, Sanya? Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation. Um, we just had a comprehensive overview uh, from the other panelists uh, of what AI can, do, AI can do in the field of health and the potential of AI in health sector. It, it is really promising and it can be really disruptive uh, as well. But at the same time, it's one of the most challenging application areas of AI due to the sensitive nature of health data. Um, many important aspects were brought up by the previous panelists. We heard about empowerment of patients and citizens, AI supporting healthcare professionals in their work and making sure that there is this human oversight of the AI tools uh, we talked about skills, ethics, trust, security, uh, also impact of COVID on health systems as a trigger for faster, have, for the need of having faster digital transformation in health and in health sector. So a lot is going on right now in the health sector when it comes to data and AI. And the commission has also been working on creating a comprehensive policy framework for AI in general, so across all sectors. And it's very much along the lines of what was mentioned by the previous speakers. So we need to ensure that AI technologies work for people. We need to have the talent and skills in place in Europe to be able to do it and to have the policy framework that ensures that AI systems um, are trustworthy and that there's an EU vision on sustainable and trustworthy AI. So EU profiles itself as a place to be uh, for developing trustworthy AI um, solutions and respecting human rights, respecting uh, privacy of people. Um, and at the same time, we do need to also make sure that we have the critical computing capacities here in Europe to be able to technically scale up the AI solutions in Europe and also that the companies, including smaller companies, SMEs, have, um, have also the su support structure in place to be able to go to the market with their inno innovative solutions, because this has also been a bit of a bottle bottleneck in, in the field. Um, for this reason, the com Commission is really supporting collaboration on, among the different stakeholders and also setting up testing and experimentation facilities to overcome the last hurdle of 
going to the market. So this is something that we are also supporting in the Digital Euro program, which was actually uh, the first work program was published last week. Um, we are really uh, planning substantial support for the different uh, data spaces, including in health, and we have the European Health Data Space Regulatory um, Initiative. So it, it all comes together as a um, framework of regulatory and invest regulatory measures, measures, investments and policy measures in order to really move forward in Europe and prof with this profile in mind uh, that I just said. Um, so why would we need a regulation uh, on AI? So um, this is really re related to the aim of having the safeguards in place for ensuring the high quality of data that was also mentioned, to have the appropriate skills and the trustworthy AI systems. So we all know that AI can do many good things, but it can also uh, it can bring efficiencies um, and uh, empower citizens and so on. But this can be done in Europe only when safety of consumers and users is ensured and when the fundamental rights and privacy are respected. Because this is these are the European values. Um, so we need to deal with the risks involved, and for that reason, uh, the AI regulation has been put forward. And as Mrs. Kumpula Natri mentioned in her opening speech, the proposed regulatory framework for AI has a risk-based approach. So this means that AI applications that are unacceptable, that are sort of too high risk, uh, they are they are prohibited and those AI applications that have minimal or no risk, they are permitted with no restrictions. So there's a sort of a scale. Um, and for medical devices, it's mentioned that, that they are high risk AI um, applications. So they will have to have a robust risk management system in place and um, they have to take into account the intended purpose of the system and the requirements for high risk AI systems would include, for example, the obligation to use high quality data for training, validation and testing, to have in place appropriate technical documentation that ensures traceability and auditability of the system. Also, the transparency and information requirements have to be fulfilled. And uh, the, the systems have to comply with the requirements of human oversight, robustness, accuracy, and cybersecurity. So not only data protection, but also cybersecurity. Um, when it comes to the European Health Data Space um, Regulatory Initiative that we are expecting very soon, there we are really looking at the big picture of, of, of the regulatory framework for health data. So, it will be something complementary to, for example, cross-border healthcare directive, which is the legal basis for cross-border border exchange of patient data. We have the GDPR, which has, which is uh, uh, regulating the also health data and all personal data. We have Data Governance Act, which is regulating the data flows in all sectors, and the AI regulation, which is also looking at all sectors. So here we are sort of with the European Health Data Space Regulatory Initiative, we intend to fill the gaps that are still missing for health sector and for health data. So the end result, we expect to be a set of rules that will bring legal certainty to the use of health data and AI for different purposes without compromising the, the high level of security, trust and privacy that we are used to here in Europe. And that, that way we really aim to make uh, Europe the place to be for, for developing safe and trustworthy AI um, solutions. Thank you. Yo, thank you very much indeed. And also for bringing in the, the question of the, of the European health data space, uh, because it is of course important both for treatment of patients across the borders, but also I suppose for analytical purposes. But would you say that the data space needs to be in place before the AI regulation can uh, can can uh, operate. One and secondly, uh, yeah, you do you give a kind of a time frame when, when this can all be in place? Uh, well, we all know that there is a certain process that has to 
has to go, we go have to we go through a certain process, um, the regulatory um, uh, processes. So the AI regulation is already sort of in the move and, uh, and we have the Data Governance Act and then the data, and the European Health Data Space Act will sort of complement the Data Act. So it's, it's a sort of a, a train where the, where the European health data will sort of jump into it. <laughs> um, and it will, as I said, to come up with this holistic uh, regulatory complementary framework, it's very difficult to predict the timelines because it, because it really depends on the co-legislators um, pace of how, how long everything takes. So it really, it's not in our, not in the hands of the commission even. Um, so of course we hope as soon as possible, but this is the, so we are expecting the European Health Data Space Initiative to come out beginning of next year because there, there have been extensive consultations mm -hmm. Uh, that have to be taken into account first. Sorry, I can't give you any. No, no, I didn't expect that. But sometimes you have the feeling about something if if people feel the urgency and so on and so forth. But I have a, I I had the feeling from the European Parliament that there was a positive tone there as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I also can see that the, the data space needs to go hand in hand with this to make it operate. And actually, this AI I think could could deepen, let's say, the value of the European data space as well. But I'm just wondering, because we came to the uh, to the end of the panelists, so thank you very much for the introductory remarks here. Uh, and I also want to say that if anybody from the audience wants to raise their hand to ask questions, please do so, and we'll keep an eye on it. But just before we go to that, can I just ask out here, and I don't know who of you wants to answer this, but, but my feeling is that we all a little bit afraid of this. We all talk about the trust issue all the time, you know, uh, trust for everybody who can create the trust. Is it better that it's done on a national level than, than on a European level or whatever? Uh, but what about the advantages? I mean, why are we not presenting this a little bit more bravely? Like, you know, uh, this is actually the solution to a lot of the problems we have. And I think the main, the, the main issue we have today is the overburdening of the health systems. First of all, because of the demographic developments that we had before, but also because of this, uh, sorry, damned COVID, you know, that just goes on and on and on. And now we were just trying to work ourselves into the into the delayed uh, treatments we had. And now we see what's happening. Uh, we also have problems on the health professional side, you know, with, uh, with getting enough people and so on. So we can't just put more money in and get more people because there's scars. So is this a solution? And is it also something we should try to advocate a little bit more the advantages, let's say, to patients and so on and so forth, because it is a way to create a less invasive, more precise uh, patient pathway, I suppose we've heard a number of times here. Are we talking too much about the problems or too little about the advantages? What do you all think? I'm certainly willing to, to have a little bit. Yes, of, Rachel. A discussion on that one. Um, I, I think we need to take a very realistic pace with this because um, while this is an answer to many of our problems, and certainly the UK has the lowest ratio of certain uh, doctors, it has the lowest ratio of certain types of scanners in Europe. You know, I think we're second lowest in the number of CT scanners. We have huge pressure on our system. Um, if we move too fast, uh, we may be doing this in a tactical way that is not scalable or safe um, at scale. And so for me, you know, if you're gonna build a city, you have to do proper town planning and proper city planning and proper architecture and proper engineering. We need to, to do this in a very planned way. It certainly provides us with many answers in the future, but rushing it will give us a false start and all of the trust Mikhail talked about, we will lose, you know, and, and Sarah talked about as well, many aspects um, of, of uh, robustness. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, we need a robust scientific approach to this that is governed properly. And it will provide answers for the future, but if we try and make it provide our answers today for all of our COVID backlogs, We'll do it badly and we'll set ourselves back. So for me, there is, um, I find that we're having to, at the moment, provide a paced journey and defend 
the amount of time and robustness and scientific approach we provide to these things. I'll highlight Dr. Rizwan Malik, who used to work for me, who won an AI Med Award, who involved medical directors, regional medical staff in his, his algorithms safety. Um, we, we, need, we need to defend our professionalism around this approach. So for me, yes, there are answers, but these answers, if they come quickly, will also come with many downsides. Yeah, I see that, uh, Rachel, but my point was also when we communicate to the broader public, you know, that in the end should embrace this. Uh, we, I know we shouldn't rush or anything like that, but we should also talk about advantages as well as problems, I suppose. Right? I think so. And I think, you know, when you look at an aeroplane that's in the sky or you look at a car, you know all about the engineering behind that. You, you know all about the yeah. professions that, that oversight that. And I think with our public, we don't just talk about the use of their data. We also talk about, you know, the great upsides of this, but also the professions and the time that it takes. You don't get a new uh, craft in the sky yeah. within six months. Um, and I, I think we need to use metaphors and analogies with the public uh, to show them the great upsides, but also the, the effort that will be taken to, to leverage that safely. Michelle, you're nodding. Uh, you are working with the patients all the time. What do you say? I, I, I totally agree with this approach. I think, uh, you know, also from, from our side and uh, from the discussion we had with our community, indeed, uh, the, the benefits of artificial intelligence are clear and are so broad and touching all the, 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 the aspects of, yeah, the care pathway, but even beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it, the, the benefits are clear, but at the same time, I think a realistic approach uh, a paced approach, as as Rachel was saying, it's it's very important because, uh, yes, uh, you know, COVID, I think it 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 had the chance to improve a little bit the way that citizens, in a way, discuss more, are more aware about data, more aware about digital solutions. Now everybody more or less has you know the COVID safe ticket up or whatever it is, uh, based on different countries. So I think uh, there is a uh, um, there is an additional readiness out there, uh, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I think with readiness needs to come uh, needs to come additional level of uh, uh, of scrutiny because uh, we also can see how uh, digital solution ultimately have to be used. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, there will be less data, uh, the, and if something happens, the trust that. Uh, um, Everybody, I think, in this room, you know, like from different perspective, is trying to build. Uh, uh, can maybe reach as a as a halt in a way. I mean, we don't want to find ourselves in a digital health hesitancy situation as we have with vaccines. In a way, we want to kind of actually go the opposite way. We want to try to build uh, that uh, uh, that that confidence in digital health bit by bit. So I think. Uh, it's it's important to to keep the pace of innovation, uh, to really make sure that uh, we take advantage of what's out there, we take advantage of what's safe. But I think you know a realistic approach, trying to make sure that nothing wrong happened to individuals, it's it's of utmost important, especially in in what I think we all agree on. This is a multi-stakeholder activity. So you yeah. know professional needs to be skilled. Uh patient needs to be needs to understand uh, and have like a good conversation with professionals. Uh industry needs to be able to to work with the right regulatory framework and the right regulatory framework also needs to be then uh implemented and supported by everybody. Uh so I think it's uh it's 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 good to be realistic uh try not to you know to lose the train of innovation yeah. uh, in a way yeah step by step as you were saying but uh, it's important that the first steps are also taken i think we've taken one today so uh, i hope this will be followed up by more discussions any of you others uh, claudia sarah any yeah, further comments I can maybe add uh, I think yeah what we see claudia. Is, uh, two things one mm. is that change management we should not underestimate uh, whether it's the patients or the physician, you know, they have a way of working, a way of uh, handling. And uh, to Rachel's point, I think we need to take it step by step because rushing into that will have the, the opposite effect. And um, we talk a lot about data. Um, what we also see is if you can prove really the value that's in for them, yeah. that is really what uh, will drive the adoption. Uh, because we, we talk a lot about the data, but what's in for them? 
And I think we need to articulate that very, very strongly. And then last point is that collaboration, that I, that connection that I said before is like, I think we need to be all in this together, uh, the policymakers, the physicians, the hospitals, the industry, uh, because only then I, I believe we can be successful. Um, but uh, do it slow and do it good and make use of the opportunities uh, in front of us. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Sarah? Yes, uh, well, I, I will not be so different. So I do agree with, we do agree with this approach. Uh, uh, um, take it uh, in the correct uh, pace, especially because if the doctors do not have the proper uh, digital skills, they will not, uh, it will be very difficult to know yeah. and to prove a malfunction or a defective uh, uh, um, AI system. And so this is indeed a concern. And uh, when a doctor is using um, AI, uh, the liability risks that can come uh, out of it. And, and so this can indeed be a barrier if there is no legal certainty on who is responsible to do what at what level, especially when we have um, self-learning algorithms. So um, for, for the doctor, also the upcoming civil liability rules uh, will be very important to create this legal certainty and dynamic that is needed in the, in the AI environment. And also, if we push uh, too much, another concern was in relation with telemedicine, that, for example, we see in certain countries, uh, the closure of uh, healthcare facilities, uh, especially in those rural areas or uh, where distance is too long, or um, also if they start, member states start fixing certain targets to, to identify, we have to, to comply with X. Uh, and so for, for the, the healthcare professionals and for the doctors in particular, it's important that uh, it is indeed the doctor that says, well, we need to have this in-person um, consultation and, and no, not so much uh, on, on the target. So uh, our appeal uh, is again to do this in the, in the proper timing. And I suppose that this goes all across the, 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 the doctors uh, uh, where you meet them. Uh, I mean, one thing is, of course, on the hospital, you know, to be able to use it. But I think the, the primary health care also needs to be able to, to talk to people about these issues. and and give them some kind of evaluation of whether this is a good way or not a good way for them. Indeed, and just to add on that, we are also uh, mentioning that we need perhaps new professions that can do this bridge between patients and doctors and have the time uh, to explain everything to the patient and have the, those digital health specialists that uh, when we are using a software uh, and to help uh, uh, with the patient. So to have these new professions coming up, that would also be something that we are highlighting. I uh, need to ask also you, Sally, do you think that, uh, that the Commission can create the trust? I mean, can the EU create the trust or is it better to do it at that level at, or at the national level or do we need to work together with national and regional authorities as well? Well, I would say to work together for sure. And of course, uh, it's, it's embedded in the regulatory processes that we are doing. We have to do large consultations. We are talking to the stakeholders at every step. Hmm. And then we have the member states and the European Parliament. So it is a, always, it takes time, but it's a comprehensive uh, round of, uh, result of comprehensive round of uh, consultations uh, always. Yeah. And especially here, it's extremely important to do it properly. Yeah, but I also think the step-by-step -step approach, uh, in a way, is also a way to ensure that we don't walk into some accidents or disasters with the data and so on and so forth, because you know how much uh, how much emphasis can be put on, on anecdotes in this context. And if you believe that the skepticism has gone, just look at the low, inf well, relatively many people who, are, who don't get the COVID uh, vaccine these days. Um, I have to ask my uh, colleague Daniel Brady, uh, do we have anybody on the waiting list for questions? Do you think? Because I can't see any here. We Daniel? don't. We don't at the moment. No. No. Uh, good. The questions. Oh, but you're welcome to uh, to come up with questions. Also, if there's some people who disagree, because we seems to be quite quite in agreement here on a number of things. But then let me ask, and you don't need to necessarily go to your national background but do you have any does anybody know about good examples or best practices that could be emulated around Europe do we have places where and I'm not talking about regulatory aspects but I'm talking about uh, let's say convincing use of artificial intelligence I think Rachel you were nodding I don't know if that was to the cat or to uh, to to me <laughs> sorry for that 
you deserve that. Okay, Rachel. <laughs> yes, no, no, it wasn't the cat. The cat. Has okay, to good. Yeah. Um, yes. So, so the example that you know, the the small examples that I'm seeing done well, um, are are, are, are distributed actually. But the, the one example I've been involved in, um, was at Bolton, where I had previously been a director and a CIO. And they implemented the Cure.ai uh, algorithm with the supervision of Dr. Rizwan Malik and the medical director to change the, the workflow and process during COVID. Now, what I would say about that process is it was very well done. We could not deploy thousands of algorithms with that rigor. However, we have to learn how to, to be more efficient about it. But it was a joy for me to see a team at what is a regional hospital work together uh, with confidence to deploy an algorithm to enhance their response to COVID mm. um, and to learn together how to govern and maintain that algorithm. And for me, I think part of the joy there was not seeing necessarily that algorithm in, in operation, but it was more seeing people catalyzed to gain a confidence in how they use uh, intelligence and algorithms to change process. And, and in this case, the radiology process is being changed. And, and so there is a huge amount here of learning and confidence to be gained by uh, professionals in the healthcare system as to how to use this to change their practice and right. how to, to, to change um, the way that they, they actually implement workflows or decision-making. And, and so that's a, a lovely example I use in my teaching um, not because it could be replicated at scale and pace, mm -hmm. but because it is a set of people who have now gained confidence and understand how they will uh, incorporate algorithms and manage algorithms in, in the, their enterprise, their, in the, within their, their hospital. Um, and I see other small examples, you know, brainomics being used. Um, I'm also seeing some examples around cellular pathology, which is different actually, because that's not where we're augmenting or replacing humans. It's where we have more data than humans could ever work on. Yeah. So that's another case that I'm seeing. Um, so for me, th those little pinpricks of, of narrative and story about how it's being done well are what we need to share. I'd like to ask others as well, but just as we added, Rachel, um, I was sometimes wondering, uh, because when, during the COVID, I think, don't think we've ever tested so many people ever for something. And what we got out of it was negative or positive, you know, the positive was the negative and so on. Whatever. But the point is, did we actually use the situation to begin to personalize the treatments after that? Because did we ever try to combine various patient data with the negative and the positive result in order to get a better explanation of why this person was hit hard and this person was not hit hard and what might be the best treatment and so on and so forth. Um, I know we have the data and can do it later on, but do you have any examples of, of actually trying to use artificial intelligence to the COVID treatment? So, so I would very much say that it was a combination of data scientists and intelligence that was used. And I would pull out the example of London mm. um, and the great work that uh, Luke Redmond and his team have done uh, there. And, and the point there was that, that data was being used as part of system response, but also to look at comorbidities and outcomes. Um, and they were using GP data. And again, the data is not perfect. And so no. cleaning of that data and codification had to be done. But I would point to that systemic response where humans and algorithms were working together to, to look at, at, at the efficacy of data. But the other wonderful thing and, and the most compelling thing around, around that response for me was the engagement, the sort of citizens' juries and the uh, consultation with citizens about how the data was being used for research that went hand in hand. So the, they did it in a very wise, very transparent and very compelling way, which allowed them to understand both uh, early signals of uh, within the population, uh, perhaps one or two weeks before a, uh, a, a sort of rise in the COVID levels would hit a hospital, but also um, some of the data around comorbidities and efficacy of some of the treatments as well. Yeah. Okay, but uh, there's probably quite a lot of things we don't understand about the COVID yet that, that AI could help with. Claudia, I just wanted to ask, do you have good, good examples, not necessarily something you as an industry has been working on, but have you come across 
examples around where where we have best practices of AI and the use of AI in health? Um, yes, I, I think uh, what we see is, uh, well, first of all, for artificial intelligence, we really need a lot of data. And I think yeah. that's often where do you put the boundary between do I have enough data to really call it artificial mm -hmm. intelligence? Uh, but what we do see is that in some of uh, the solutions and, and the physicians we work with, that um, the data and the artificial intelligence really can help us to get to better outcomes. So we do mm -hmm. have a really evidence-based, um, let's say, proof uh, mm -hmm. that certain procedures that we have been able to reduce uh, the variability. Um, also on the imaging, uh, imaging technology, if you start like really comparing it, um, a same procedure with many, many worldwide, what is that uh, uh, bringing us, telling us? And, um, and that's a few examples where I really see the value and what's in for them, what is the outcome? And, and I think that's the only way to really get to uh, the adoption. Uh, so yes, we have a few examples, uh, but what I believe is we need much, much more data so where is that boundary between do I have enough data to really get to the point where you can really start predicting? Uh, but yes, we do have some uh, examples where we really mm -hmm. see reducing the variability of first uh, procedures uh, or uh, increasing uh, or improving the efficiency or the outcome for the patient. Yes. Yeah, that's what it's about in the yeah. end. But Celia, I mean, I do, you don't have any eye on specific ways this has been done or the communication and so on and so forth and, and let me just I add to it that i know that by the end of this month the uh, european version of health at a glance will come out you know with the with the national um, uh, sub reports as well do you know if if the question of ai has been taken up there as an example and if not should we try to do that later on to broaden a little bit the knowledge about the developments in this area sorry if that was too many questions but anyway go on Sonia. Was it for me? Yeah, it yeah. was indeed. Yeah. No, I, I'm. Well, my first one was as a commission. Have uh, Have you been inspired by anybody around in, uh, in uh, in Europe on this? Well, I must say that we we did organize uh, last year. Uh, there were several calls for proposals and uh, emergency funding uh, provided for. Um, SMEs and other um, solution providers to really to come up quickly with the solutions such as um, biomarker detection for the deterioration of patients' conditions or um, looking at lung scans and uh, predictive algorithms um, to help with doctors with um, to see what would be the, the, the trajectory of a specific patient entering the hospital. And, and, and indeed, these are very promising um, solutions. And, and hopefully in the next few months, they are already, they can already safely uh, say that uh, something very useful has come, come out. So we, we really mobilized very quickly uh, funds for supporting um, SMEs and the, the success, I mean, the, the, the success rate or the, the, the amount of applicants to these calls was really overwhelming, which yeah. also showed that there was a very high interest and willingness from, from all stakeholders to help and to come up quickly with, uh, with new solutions, uh, including AI solutions to help with COVID. Yeah, okay. Anybody else, Michelle, Sarah, no? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I was just uh, wanted to mention uh, you know, on those examples that uh, indeed uh, I think it was in Belgium, but I, I'm, I'm sure that there were uh, in uh, other countries where there was this use of uh, uh, scans of, uh, of the lungs and uh, subsequent follow ups for mm -hmm. treatments uh, that were improved due to the use of AI. So I think this was already recorded and a lot of research came out of it. Um, and also in relation to the exchange of health data. So that was indeed uh, seen that public health data uh, needed to be exchanged more. And in this way, the commission presented European health, uh, um, the European Union health packages and the cross-border, um, the serious cross-border health threats. So there we see already some exchange of public health data and also the future competences of the CDC will also foresee and have this important role. 
Tell me, uh, sorry, I mentioned in the introduction my, my interest in the early diagnosis and precise diagnosis, you know, and, and indicating pathways. And I think we've touched upon this, Claudia mentioned a couple of times. But, um, but how can we actually expect, let's say, the primary health care sector to take care of these kind of things? I mean, do they have the equipment? Can they do the data? Or do we need to refer them to sort of an intermediary institution, as we talk about, between the doctor and the hospitals? I mean, I, I know that, uh, well, you, you mentioned Belgium, and I know in Flanders, for example, there's a, there's a big uh, revolution in, in fact taking place in the primary healthcare sector now. But is it something, if we, if we do that better or modernize, uh, do the things for the 21st century, as, as it's called, uh, are we able to start the process already there, you think? That is indeed a good question, because you know, the doctors have accumulated experience of well, the normal uh, surgeon, doctor, uh, normally when they treat patients, they have their own specific databases with they treat with yeah. care so that they can improve also future uh, diagnosis and treatment uh, on a personal level with future patients that they have. So they have these their own personal databases. And so at some point, if uh, these databases that are theirs and the uh, are taken from and need to start putting the system. This can also be very tricky, even for them to 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 do this kind of situation. Mm -hmm. For the for the healthcare system, we also see different situations in different countries. So, for example, in Germany, uh, there is in public health systems the, there there are certain softwares that are trying are currently being implemented where the doctor will need to use that specific software in the in the hospital. So, with this it's not so clear and we have not uh, yet understood how the data will be used for, mm -hmm. for the future. But giving the example uh, of France, they have the French Health uh, Data Hub and they are already using data um, in, a, in a way that is quite uh, protective. So the, they have this one-stop shop where uh, everyone can uh, apply to, to gather and to collect data from from this entity. And once they do this application, uh, it will be analyzed and sent to two different entities. So an ethics committee and the, um, the National Data Protection Authority. So they have found their system and their way to, to use uh, the health data and to have this quality of input uh, for future um, AI. So I think it will also depend on each system to try to find a little bit of their own guided uh, by what the commission will will yeah, that's probably true but the problem is also if you if you develop too many national systems and develop them they will risk you know coming up in like the electrical block that we still can't harmonize that i mean it can also become a barrier because we have our system and you have your system and i'm talking as a person who have doctors in three different european countries and i want them to be able to work together when i get sick you know one day <laughs> so uh, let's develop the good examples but also sally i'll make certain that uh, we don't wait too long to have a european framework to to govern this claudia can i just because i want to come back to michelle as well but just just to to answer Ask, you know, when I asked this question about early diagnosis and so on and so forth, I know the big market for the industry is, of course, the hospitals. But are you also, are you also looking at improving the conditions for, let's say, the primary health care, the early detection and so on, to be able to use the anticipated intelligence? Or is that not, not important for you? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, for us, we always think of uh, what we call the three personas. So we, we think of the patient and you know, the environment, uh, you know, where they live, uh, we have the physicians, and then you have really the hospital where we look more at the administrative processes and how, mm. how you can drive efficiency there. But absolutely, and for us, very important, if you really look, look at that pathway, is that how do we get a patient like really empowered, but also like 100% ready before they go into surgery, and you go through the surgery where the patient feel really like guided and coached, and then post also like, how do you get to a maximum outcome in recovery? Because sometimes we only think of the surgery, but for us that pathway end to end, we always think of the pathway end to end, whether it's out of, uh, with the view of a patient, the view of a, uh, a surgeon or the view of a hospital. Uh, and that's really where we believe if you really want to transform healthcare, you really need to take the pathway end to end. Um, and that's also why that ecosystem and connecting our solutions and having an open system that allows for connecting all these different systems, I think is key to achieve that. And Michelle, I think you will be the, the last speaker in this. Uh, any comments to the discussion we're having now? 
No, I think, you know, everything it's 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 pretty much in line with, with what we think as well, you know, like indeed uh, uh AI has a lot of potential uh and has potential throughout, you know, uh the 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 pathway of, of a patients and even before in terms of, uh, you know, prevention and uh, really making sure mm. that you own your own health in a way. I think it has it has it has a big potential in doing this, but indeed uh, it will need to happen uh, as, as we discussed at the right pace and with the right frameworks. And indeed, uh, we are we are very much looking forward to uh, to to what the European health data space is going to look like, because it's going to be more than just data. It's going to it's going to touch on artificial intelligence. Intelligence is gonna really try to drill in, you know, b- based on this horizontal legislation, really yeah. trying to make it specific for health because it's important and because it's it's such a particular sector that even, you know, what could be perceived as low risk, ultimately even just a system that puts you in a consultation two weeks after it can have an important impact okay. uh, of the life of a patient. So I think, you know. The specificity of healthcare, the more is really taken into consideration in how the uh, the frameworks around AI, data, and so on, uh, the, the better it will be for, for everybody. And the better we'll try to create, you know, what we ultimately all want. So to have Europe at the forefront of, uh, of, of health innovation for uh, to, to make sure the patients get the best care possible uh, mm-hmm. throughout Europe without Indeed. inequalities. And also stimulate the development of a European industry in this area, I suppose. And uh, Michel, remember, you have a big responsibility because the uh, the patient organizations are very much trusted by the patients. So you have a crucial role in this together with, uh, with uh, all others here. So uh, uh, with this, I think we came to the, to the end. Let me just say that uh, I think there's one issue we didn't uh, mention, but we should probably carefully also think about when we look at the various payment systems that they actually give an incentive for doctors to uh, to use this uh, artificial intelligence you know in in a proper way so uh, i think we need uh, to to look into that area as well i think there's issues also relating to eu which is about procurement issues and so on so forth and what kind of uh, maybe uh, the, the, what comes out the framework that comes out will also set some guidelines there but it is important that that the right way of uh, of acquiring these systems uh, is followed as well so that we can we can uh, we can keep the trust in order to be able to develop uh, artificial intelligence uh, i saw a joke one day about a guy who was uh, a cl- clever Professor Rachel, like you, uh, interviewed, well, are you afraid it was the question of artificial intelligence? And the professor answered back and said, no, I'm not worried about the the wealth of artificial intelligence. I'm more worried about the lack of an ordinary human intelligence. So uh, you can think a little bit about that. But uh, I would like to thank very much all of you, Rachel, um, also uh, Sarah, um, Michelle, Claudia, and Salia uh, for let's say, responding to all the questions about impatience in the European Commission. So thank you, or what's happening within the EU, rather. So thank you very much for all for taking out your time. Thank you very much for the participants to join us for this discussion. Uh, and I hope we have clarified some of the issues and maybe started some of the first steps in developing the confidence in artificial intelligence. So we'll come back to the issue. But thank you very much and have a nice afternoon and evening as well. Bye.